So um, welcome to session 1042. This tutorial session covers migrating virtual machines to Rancher Harvester. Uh, your presenter today will be myself, Alejandro Bonilla from SUSE and Gerville Adrian Safira from Codbase. Uh, but before we transition uh, to the specifics of how we're migrating virtual machines, let's do a quick there we go, let's do a quick introduction to Harvester. Harvester is an open source, hyper-converged infrastructure software built on top of our Kubernetes. There's the uh, URL, just so you can visit the website and join the Slack community and uh, see further into the project. Uh, but now as we understand today, traditional HCI platforms integrate storage and virtualization but they also carry a proprietary API. But proprietary APIs do not integrate well with applications outside of their own vendor. So one of the goals of Harvester is to introduce an HCI 2.0, replacing the proprietary API with the open industry standard API, Kubernetes. Uh, designed for users looking for a cloud native HCI solution, Harvester is a flexible, affordable offering capable of uh, putting VM workloads in the data center on the edge, uh, close to your IoT, and integrated into your cloud infrastructure. And with that, let's just review Harvester's architecture. Currently, it runs on K3OS nodes and leverages Kubebird for virtual machines automation and management tasks. Uh, and as well as Longhorn for persistence block, persistent block storage. There are other components into it, like Multus for networking, um, uh, but we can uh, look into those in different uh, harvester sessions. Um, finally, here's a quick view of the dashboard, which currently includes a VM monitoring, VNC and serial console access, and configuration for networks, keys and VM templates, backups, and much more. But if you'd like to know more about Harvester, just please join another Harvester session as they focus on the solution itself. Um, and now that we looked into the basics of Harvester, let's transition to Gabriel, which will actually introduce us into Coriolis. Thanks for the introductions, Alejandro. So before we dive into an actual demo of Coriolis and we get to show you how it works together with Harvester by migrating an instance from uh, VMware to Harvester, I'm going to give you a few details about Coriolis and what it is, how it works. It's a little bit about its architecture, its supported platforms, um, and the various types of migration that exist and where Coriolis fits into all of that. Now, traditionally, when we speak about migration, uh, there are four major uh, topics that people usually tackle. There's re-architecting, which means that you rewrite your application from scratch or uh, rewrite as much as possible to make it work uh, more cloud natively and take advantage of, uh, of uh, uh, solutions such as Kubernetes, Docker, and uh, whatnot. <clears throat> you can repurchase, meaning that you ditch your current stack but uh, you purchase one that will fulfill the, all your needs uh, and is already cloud native. This is the most expen the more expensive approach. You can replatform, meaning you can migrate your uh, services such as data databases to things that already uh, are supported by your uh, cloud platform of choice. Uh, like you, you may have a, a software as a service somewhere that may fulfill your needs, or you can rehost. Rehosting means that you simply pick up your current existing um, infrastructure, you simply move it to another platform and make it work in such a way that it will essentially look and feel as if it was always part of, uh, of that environment. <clears throat> and this is where Coriolis fits in. Coriolis is a lift and shift migration solution. It's fully automated, so all you have to do is point it to your source cloud, uh, your, your instances on your source cloud, your destination cloud, tweak a few things because you might want to have those instances live in particular networks on particular storage or do last minute uh, changes to your instances before they come online. It's scalable, 
it's uh, built just like an OpenStack project, so it can scale horizontally. It can do one migration at a time if you'd like, <clears throat> or it can do many migrations at a time. It depends on how how, how many migrations your source cloud and your destination cloud w uh, can sustain uh, before bottlenecks appear like uh, network or CPU or IO. It has a full REST API for aut automation. So you can script every uh, every aspect of Coriolis' uh, feature set. If you'd like to create your own interface to Coriolis in your own application, you can. Um, and it uses Keystone as an identity management system, the same Keystone that is used in OpenStack. This is uh, Coriolis' architecture. As you can see, it, it has a REST API, a client, uh, both GUI and CLI. We're, we're going we're to see the GUI in this demo. It uses Keystone uh, for identity, as I've mentioned. It has a conductor and a scheduler. These are the brains of the operations. operation. Together, they uh, make sure that appropriate tasks get scheduled to appropriate servers. And we have the workers, which are, well, the workhorses of Coriolis. This is where the actual code that interfaces with your source and destination clouds lives. And it uses Barbican for secrets. All of these, uh, most of these, except for, Cor for the Coriolis components, are OpenStack projects. Uh, you may know of them if you've ever worked with OpenStack. And the main, uh, the, the main uh, part of uh, Coriolis, the, the, the stuff that actually makes it work, are the so-called providers. Providers are uh, plugins for Coriolis that allows Coriolis to interface with a cloud. They define strict um, uh, interfaces that allows them to be developed in uh, in parallel. So as long as you have an export provider for one cloud and an import provider for another cloud, they can work together and you can transfer virtual machines from one source to a destination, regardless of what the source or destination is. There are two modes of operation for Coriolis. And we're going to go into um, uh, all of this stuff as we show you the demo. But essentially, there are two modes of operations, and you're going to see this later on. There are migrations. This is a one-off operation where you just point Coriolis to an instance or many instances and say, migrate them now. And just Coriolis just goes out, uh, copies over the disk data from source to destination. Uh, it creates the resources on the destination. And at the end of the operation, you have a fully working virtual machine instance or a cluster of machines, depending on how many you selected when you uh, created the migration, on your destination. They're a one-to-one -one copy uh, with as much as, uh, as much as possible preserved from the source in terms of IP addresses, MAC addresses, and so on. But that part depends uh, very much on the clouds that are involved. Some clouds will allow you to do this. Some clouds won't allow you to do this. And by this, I mean uh, main, uh, retain the MAC address or the IP address. And replicas is the second uh, mode of operation. The same code that governs migrations also governs replicas, but replicas are more granular. They allow you to split the operation in two. They allow you to split uh, uh, one migration into the, 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 the disk sync part of the operation and the actual deployment part of the operation. Now, this is important for one big reason. You can choose to sync your data from source to destination many times over and only commit to migrating that instance when your source cloud goes down. It's not a matter of if, it's, most times it's a, it's a matter of when. So when disaster strikes, and this is the disaster recovery as a service uh, implementation, when disaster strikes, you can, only, you can then choose to migrate your instances. Up until that point, you only have the disk data on your destination and the metadata about the instance. So how many CPUs it should have, how much RAM, how much, uh, what networks it should be connected to, and so on. And you can choose to run a replica for a particular instance as many times as you wish and keep it as in sync as possible. So, <clears throat> so you have the most up-to-date version of that instance on the destination and only migrate when needed. Now we have support, as I've said, for multiple clouds. We have OpenStack uh, and VMware vSphere. These, these are the two providers that were in the initial release of Coriolis. And of course, we support multiple hypervisors with OpenStack. And of course, the popular um, the public clouds are also in here, including a bunch from Oracle and of course, KubeVirt. I'm not gonna take any more time with, uh, with uh, slides. Time to dive into a demo.
And before we do, if you'd like to know more about Coriolis and what it is, head over to our website at cloudbased.it slash Coriolis. And of course, if you'd like to experiment with it, drop us a line, but let's dive in, excuse me, let's dive into the demo. We're going to be migrating this particular instance and in OpenSUSE Leap 15 from VMR vSphere to Harvester. So we see here Coriolis. We, I deployed Coriolis as a virtual machine inside Harvester, but you can also deploy Coriolis as containers inside your Kubernetes cluster if you'd wish. It's, uh, it's like I said, it's built just like an OpenStack project. Uh, it's microservice-based and you can deploy it in containers. That's what we actually do in this particular uh, virtual machine, but we use Docker instead of Kubernetes because it's a simple all-in-one appliance. And this, of course, is Coriolis, our cloud migration tool. This is the replica screen. When you log in for the first time, what you actually see is this particular dashboard. And before you can actually do anything with it, you have to go to cloud endpoints. I'm going to show you how to de define your cloud endpoints, how, how to give it credentials for your uh, source and destination clouds. I'm just going to do one fictitious uh, endpoint. Uh, I'm going to show you how to validate them and then go on to replicas. So all you have to do is go to new endpoint. Here you can choose your uh, cloud, the one you want to add credentials for. Let's go with kubevert. For kubevert, all you have to do is give it a name, uh, harvester demos, to say. choose a file, um, I think, and give it a kube config. That's all you have to do. Validate and save. It will go out, uh, try to connect to the Kubernetes APIs, validate that kubevert is installed. And if it is, you'll see that green check mark, and you can now use it as a destination provider in this case. So after you've defined your endpoints, you just go to replicas, <clears throat> click on create replica. And here you have a choice between uh, simple migrations, uh, the one-off operation I mentioned earlier, and Coriolis replicas, the more granular uh, approach to migrating your instances. We click next. We select our vSphere environment here, as these are source options. So Coriolis allows you to tweak <clears throat> uh, various settings for your source cloud. In this case, we want to make sure that uh, change block tracking is automatically enabled if the instance does not have this feature enabled. Uh, click Next. Now we get to select the instances we want to migrate. It goes out and starts listing instances. Let's search for SUSE. And we're going to choose this instance right here. Click Next. Select Harvester. Either one of these is fine. Uh, they're both the same deployment. And here uh, you get target options. Target options allows you to do more um, granular tweaking of the uh, destination options. So here you get to uh, specify the disk sync image. This is an image that we use to uh, ingest the disk data from your source. So on the source, we do a CBT snapshot and export. But on the destination, we need to be able to write that particular disk data block by block uh, to an actual PVC. And this is the, um, the um, application that allows us to send over those disk chunks from your source to the destination. I'm going to explain uh, this a little bit more as we go along. We give the cluster name. It's a default deployment, so it's just cluster.local. And these are maximum CPUs and um, maximum memory per instance. So for example, if you're moving away from a beefy deployment of a vSphere and you have uh, a huge amount of CPUs added to a particular VM, but you don't have that 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 amount of resources on your destination. <clears throat> Coriolis will uh, try to allocate um, uh, as many CPUs as it sees on the source on the destination, but you might not want that. So the maximum memory and CPUs are, uh, are caps for those particular resources, so you don't overwhelm your destination. You select the namespace where you want this to end up, and you're, we're just going to go with default. Click Next. In this screen, we, um, we get a chance to map 
the source networks to destination networks. So on the source, we see that this instance was uh, connected to a VM network in vSphere. That's a virtual switch in, uh, in VMware. Here we go. And on the destination, I'm just going to go with the default network because uh, be, uh, I haven't defined more than one network, even though Harvester does allow you to specify uh, to create more networks via Multis. I only have one for, for this demo, so we're just going to go with that. Storage map, but uh, to get back, if you would have had multiple NICs on the source, they would have all appeared here. And if you had multiple networks on the destination, you could have mapped them one-to-one. -one. So let's say you have 192, 168, 100, 0 on your source, and you want to map that to, to the same exact network on your destination. This is where you would do that. So you can have multiple networks on the source, multiple networks on the destination, map them here, and Coriolis will make sure that when that instance boots up, it's going to get uh, attached to the appropriate network. Same thing for disks. You, you, have, a, uh, you have the possibility to actually map uh, storage backends from the source to storage backends on the destination. So if you're moving an instance with multiple disks and you would like one disk to end up on SSDs, for example, or NVMEs, and another disk you would want to have uh, land on uh, spinning disks because you don't need that much speed on that, this is where you would do that. So, And you have various levels of granularity here. So the default storage here is Longhorn. We only have one and another uh, storage class that was created for, Im for an image from what I see. You can uh, have uh, you can map an entire storage backend to um, a storage backend on the destination, say data store one in this case, or you can map individual disks like this particular disk, which is which has the ID of two thousand, to a uh, storage backend on the on, on the destination. Now, if you have multiple disks, you can choose one to be on spinning, one on SSD, one on NVMe, like I said. So let's say your database lives on slash var. You want that disk to end up on an NVMe, maybe, or SSD at least. Click Next. This is a screen that allows you to in insert um, a user script, so to speak, that will do last minute, last minute changes during the OS morphing phase of Coriolis. Now, OS morphing, this is the first time I've mentioned it. I'm going to explain what it is when we get to it later, later inside the demo. But it, Short version is that OS morphing is the step where Coriolis will uh, make the needed changes for the instance to actually boot up properly on the destination. And you have, of course, for Windows and for Linux. For Windows, that's typically a PowerShell script or a batch script. For Linux, anything that lives inside the instance uh, that has an interpreter inside the instance. So Python, Ruby, Bash, what have you. Click Next. <clears throat> Schedules are essentially a cron-like schedule that you can create for replicas. Uh, essentially, whatever timestamp you specify here will be obeyed by Coriolis, and a replica will be kicked off for this particular instance. So this one uh, will trigger once at midnight every day. You can specify a day of week, a day of month, a month. And of course, you can set an expiration date for it if you'd like. We're not going to add one now because we won't have time to see it run. Click Next. This is a summary of everything that was selected so far. If you're happy with it, all you have to do is click Finish. And this will instruct Coriolis to create a set of tasks that will ultimately lead to a, a replica of the OpenSUSE instance on Harvester. So now we're loading the, the task list. We're validating the replica source inputs. Uh, so we're asking VMware about information about the instance, connecting to VMware vSphere host. Everything is OK. CBT is already enabled. Validating replica destination. So it's connecting to Harvester, making sure everything is fine. Deploying replica disks. Right now, we should be seeing a PVC pop up shortly, pending. This is the PVC that gets created for our instance. And it's created. It is uh, of equal or greater size to the disk on the source. So it can accommodate all the information that's going to get synced to it. Now it's going to deploy a pod, this pod. 
in particular, with the image that was specified in uh, target options, the disk sync image, if you remember, I mentioned um, there's an application that we used to ingest the disk data from source. This is that application. It's now running and it will start to create a snapshot. Now it's replicating disks. During the replica disks, it's going to create a snapshot on the vSphere. Here it, here it goes. This is a CBT snapshot that we read at the, uh, at the block device level. So the, the raw data from that snapshot, we read directly by, uh, and copy it over to Harvester. Now, the good part about this is that while that snapshot is happening, business continuity is never interrupted. So this instance that is now getting replicated is still online. And it's been online for two days now. So we never shut it down unless the user explicitly asks for this. And we simply create a CPT snapshot. That's a crash consistent snapshot. If VMware Tools is installed, it may do a, a, an application consistent snapshot. And now it's transferring over only the written blocks from the source. So the disk is of 16 gigabytes of size, but only 3.7 gigabytes of data is actually written to that instance. So we're only transferring over that particular set of information. There's no point in transferring over zeros over the wire. We just transfer over the, the written blocks. And this operation is quite fast. On this demo environment, it, it works for with, I think, about 60 megabytes per second transfer speed, which is not bad, at least for a demo env. Now, this is done. It's going to remove the CBT snapshot and delete the source, uh, the, the, the target. Uh, temporary resources, which is this particular uh, Coriolis sync. As you can see, it's terminating. It should soon go away. Now, it, and it's gone. The replica is now done. We have a one-to-one -one, uh, copy of that instance. Now, the good part about replicas is that if you wish, you can create incremental backups, incremental replicas. So let's say we want to do an echo migrating, uh, open, uh, migrating to Harvester from VMware. And let's write this to a file, say migrate me and give it a timestamp. And now we have, oops, we have that migrate me file with that particular text. Now to transfer this over, all we have to do is go to actions, execute again, and it creates another replica execution for the same instance. It goes through the same steps, but now when it gets to replicate disks, it won't have 3.7 gigabytes of data to transfer. It will only have about a few megabytes maybe of log files and uh, whatever else got fragmented or written to disk. And that's the only thing that will get transferred over to the destination. So we won't sync the whole 3.7 gigabytes again. We'll only sync a few megabytes, maybe a few kilobytes, depending on what the block size is on the source. It's it goes through the same tasks, including deploy replica disks. It does this because you may have added new disks to your instance, removed some disks, some old disks, and Coriolis will sync that information every time you run a replica. So if you add a new disk, it's going to create a PVC, a corresponding PVC in Kubernetes and in, uh, in Harvester. If you delete one, it's going to remove that PVC from, uh, from your destination. Now it's creating that pod again. It's going to be a quick operation this time. It's not going to stay too long syncing data. The pod is running. It should move to replicate disks. It's creating the CBT snapshot again. We only have about four megabytes in size to replicate. And it's done. And this is what an incremental snapshot looks like. So if you, if you have only a few megabytes of data that needs to be uh, replicated, that's uh, all that will get replicated from source to destination. Because Coriolis will keep track of the previous CPT uh, snapshot that was done and um, 
only calculate the delta from the previous run. And it does this for various other uh, clouds as well, the ones that uh, support incremental replicas, of course. For a few of them, we actually uh, made our own incremental replica solution. In any case, getting back to this, if you're happy with this replica and you feel like you want to, to migrate it, uh, like exercise your disaster recovery uh, scenario, maybe on a weekly basis, you can do that. Um, or of course, recover from an outage on, uh, on your source. All you have to do is go to actions and create migration. And here you have the option to clone disks, which will attempt to create a snapshot uh, on the source and not invalidate the replica disks. And you have an option to skip OS morphing. This is useful, for example, uh, when you migrate from a cloud that uses uh, KVM as well. For example, from OpenStack based on KVM, you can skip OS morphing because the instances should already be um, uh, created in such a way that they would just work on, on Harvester. So in any case, let's click on migrate. A new migration from this replica will be created shortly. Here we go. Click on view migration info. Now, these are another a different set of tasks that get created. These tasks have the ultimate goal of um, making sure that the instant instance ends up on Harvester and it looks and feels like it's always been there. So it will attempt to install the QM guest agent. It will uh, install the uh, cloud. It will install cloud in it. It will uninstall OpenVM tools because we no longer need it. We're not running on uh, VM or vSphere anymore. And things like this. So it's deploying OS morphing resources. Um, this is done using a temporary virtual machine. So we should see one pop up here. Here we go. This is a temporary virtual machine that gets created in Harvester to which we attach the snapshots of the PVCs that will get uh, created, uh, the PVCs belonging to the instance that we're migrating. And as soon as this uh, uh, instance is up and running, Coriolis will SSH into it and start changing um, the disks of the instance we're migrating in such a way that it will be able to boot on Harvester in the end. So now it's testing the connection to this instance. It finished creating it. If you click on console, we should see its screen. There it is. We don't need to look at it as it actually uh, boots. Let's get back to Coriolis. When it finishes booting, Coriolis will, uh, will be able to connect it via SSH and move on to OS Morphing. And I'm going to detail what OS morphing is as soon as it gets there. Now, during OS morphing, we detect the OS that we're, we're migrating. Now, Coriolis, and this is important, treats every migration as a black box initially until the point it needs to actually migrate it, where it, when it looks inside the instance and figures out what it needs to do in order to have that instance um, boot on the destination. So we'll identify the operating system and use its uh, package manager to install whatever packages need to be installed. In this case, we identify that as an OpenSUSE 15.2. We're adding the um, Cloud Tools repo to it so we can install Cloud in it and come guest agent. And the, the worker VM, the temporary worker VM can be any Linux for Linux uh, migrations. So if you're migrating um, uh, an OpenSUSE uh, slash or Ubuntu or Red Hat or what have you, you can use any Linux modern ba modern Linux based operating system to do that. Now, as soon as Cloud Init and QM Guest Agent gets installed, the Init RD will get regenerated to make sure that all needed drivers are included in the Init RD. And here we go. Now we're deleting the temporary instance that we used. It should transition shortly to terminating. It stopped, now it's terminating. So we clean up after ourselves. You don't need to worry that um, rogue instances may linger after a migration. And after the uh, OS morphing resources are cleaned up, we deploy the final instance.
And this is the phase where we finalize the, the actual migration. And here you see, we're already starting the OpenSUSE Leap 15 instance. And I think you can see it via kubectl as well. So here it is. It's getting scheduled right now. And it's done. Click on console. And we're already at prop. And it's booting. <clears throat> Let's make this a bit bigger, a bit bigger. Not sure how well you can see the screen at this point. It's quite small. The font is quite small. All right, I think we can log in. And there's the file that we created previously. And we should be able to have them side by side, I think. Here we go. Not sure if it's visible, but they're the same file with the same content. And this is our source VM. It's still up. We never touched it. Um, but we did sync all the information from it. And we created a whole different instance in Harvester that is a one-to-one -one copy of this one. That's it for all right, so uh, Gabriel, thanks a lot for um, for the demo, the introduction to Coriolis. Uh, it was great. I personally loved it as well, uh, even though I've, of course, used it and seen it. Uh, it was a great demo uh, of all the capabilities here, migrating a virtual machine to uh, Rancher Harvester. Um, so I think that concludes our session today. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, watching our our session. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, Gabriel for his time as well. And um, please visit uh, the project's website, uh, the Coriolis website, and um, the Harvester HCI website as well. Thank you and have a great day.